A carbon dioxide milestone. The amount we put in each year stayed there for a very long time. So we're building it up. So as emissions have been increasing, the build-up in the atmosphere has been accelerating. Challenges for UK farmers. It's not just things like blights that are going to affect potato crops, but also drought. And what is a climate hackathon? So we chose three themes. So one was nature-based solutions, another was marine and coastal, and the third was sustainable development. It's Friday, the 26th of March, and you're listening to Weathersnap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Claire Nazir, and this is Weathersnap, an insider's guide to the week's weather brought to you direct from Met Office HQ. A scientific paper from the Met Office outlined some of the challenges UK farmers will have to face in a changing climate. The study looks at climatic effects on the dairy and potato farming sectors over the next 30 to 50 years. Lead author is Dr Freya Gary. This is part of a big project going on across the UK called the UK Strategic Priority Funds for Climate Resilience. And my research focuses on how the UK climate is going to change in the future particularly types of events called compound events. That might be when you have very high temperatures and very dry weather at the same time. So there's more than one climate impact happening at the same time. So we use uh, temperature and humidity from a climate model and we bring them together in an equation which tells us about how the heat stress will affect uh, livestock. That might tell us that there's mild heat stress or moderate heat stress, and those will have different physiological effects on the cattle. So in the southwest, for example, the number of days that dairy cattle might experience heat stress in 30 to 50 years time might be 10 times as many days in which they currently experience heat stress. So it is a really big increase there for farmers to be coping with. There are potential options which farmers might choose. So for example, uh, if you grow trees through your pasture land, then they might give shelter to the cattle. And that's something called silvopasture. So there are these long-term adaptation strategies which could also benefit our net zero aims. So potato blight, which is a, a fungal disease, is able to spread when it's very warm and very humid. Potatoes are something that do obviously grow well in, in our climate of Western Europe, but we, we obviously know from the past that there can be seasons when potatoes do very badly. And in the future, it's not just things like blight that are going to affect potato crops, but also drought. So that can be mitigated against by irrigation, so uh, doing a lot of watering of your crops. But that's obviously very energy intensive and uses a lot of water, which in drought times, it might be uh, difficult to get uh, enough water. So, for instance, in the in the east of England, there might be a lot of pressure from drought in the future. So there might be difficult seasons for potatoes in the future. It's unlikely to be a crop, I think, that we won't be able to grow at all. I expect that we'll be seeing potatoes growing in the UK for a long time, but there certainly might be some very difficult seasons for potato growers. Dr Freya Gary. Latest research suggests the volume of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is 50% higher than pre-industrial levels. For scientists, this marks a grim milestone. Here's climate scientist, Professor Richard Betts. At the moment, we are seeing carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere go past a 50% increase from these pre-industrial levels. So we are now at 417 parts per million in the atmosphere, as opposed to 278 parts per million at the time of the Industrial Revolution, so a 50% increase. How do we know that the carbon dioxide level was at that level at that time? So you could actually get that number quite accurately from ice cores, which is basically if you drill down into, into the ice in Greenland or Antarctica, the layers of ice further down 
were built up from snow falling back then at the end of the 18th century, trapping bubbles of air in the snow, which then turned into ice. And you could analyse those trapped bubbles of air to find out the concentration of carbon dioxide at the time that snow turned to ice. There's something very interesting about the trend of CO2 since pre-industrial levels. It's not a uniform trend upwards, is it? No, it's actually been accelerating because we've been putting more and more carbon dioxide uh, into the atmosphere. And the thing about carbon dioxide is it stays in the atmosphere a long time. It's only absorbed or taken out of the atmosphere gradually through natural processes, which take decades to centuries. So essentially, the amount we put in each year stays there for a very long time. So we're building it up. So as emissions have been increasing, the buildup in the atmosphere has been accelerating. So it took 200 years for a 25% increase in CO2 from pre-industrial levels, uh, which was reached in the late 80s. Then it took another 25 years to reach the 40% increase around about 2011. And then the last decade, we've now gone to this 50% increase. Tell me about how strong the correlation is between the the rise in carbon dioxide levels due to human-induced activities and global temperature. Every step of global warming matters, but the the, the impacts tend to um, magnify with the, the greater the level of warming. So, for example, uh, when we see a doubling of CO2, in the longer term, that would mean a, a global warming of between about two and a half and four degrees Celsius in the long term, depending on other factors. And four degrees global warming, which could happen potentially by the end of this century, that would mean, for example, three and a half billion people exposed to extreme heat stress risk compared to less than 70 million who see this from time to time at the moment. It could mean 200 million people per year affected by river flooding, whereas at the moment it's about 50 million people per year. And about 30 percent of time around the world could be spent in drought in a four degree global warming world compared to about 7% at the moment. So quite substantial impacts at those levels of global warming. Professor Richard Betts. Southern states of the USA were rocked last week by a series of large and dangerous tornadoes that swept across Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi and Alabama. As conditions this week continue to favour similar storms, I spoke to Deputy Chief Forecaster Nick Silkstone to find out more. We have what's called an upper trough or a dip in the jet stream, which is currently across parts of the southwestern states, so Texas, Oklahoma, for example. And this dip in the jet stream, um, it basically helps force a surface level area of low pressure on its forward side, which is going to run up northeast close to the Mississippi. In the southeast flank of this, um, the southerly winds draw up very warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico. Then with the strong upper level jet stream circulating, the trough, it produces an environment which is highly sheared, which means the wind speed in the lower atmosphere and the upper atmosphere, if you looked at those, there's a huge difference between them, which means a, a thunderstorm updraft or a shower updraft becomes very displaced from the downdraft. And that allows basically long lived cells. And that difference in direction means that there's also a source of rotation in the atmosphere that these updrafts can then suck up and that can produce some pretty significant tornadoes. And these tornadoes in that sort of setup can rampage across a huge area. This time, the parameters are actually higher than the event last week when 54 tornadoes on the latest damage surveys were recorded across the states. And um, looking at the recent satellite picture now, you know, good brightness within that warm sector means things are starting to heat up and everything's set for discrete cells to form. And the greater the shear, the greater the rotation, before you even suck that into an updraft, the greater the probability of seeing strong or even violent tornadoes and those being more long lived. Are we now in tornado season or is it still a bit early? There's actually two peak areas of the United States that see tornadoes, the so-called Dixie Alley, which is the southern states around, for example, Alabama, uh, Georgia, that region there. Their peak tornado season is in March and April. So we're very much in the middle of that. But the typical tornado alley, which is your Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, the peak of their season tends to be slightly later in April or May. So uh, we're in peak tornado season for Dixie Alley, but we're just coming into the peak in the coming month for Tornado Alley, which is further to the north and west. Nick Silkstone, thank you very much. So how will conditions develop here in the UK over the next few days? Here with the details, Aidan McGiven. 
The phrase March many weathers will certainly ring true during the next few days. We'll start off with a cold snap, then it will turn wetter in places before a notable warm spell at the beginning of next week. But first, let's talk about that cold snap. It's very brief. Friday night into the start of Saturday, wintry showers will cross the country. That's a mixture of sleet, hail and snow for many places. But any settling snow is likely to be confined to the Pennines and the Scottish mountains. And quite quickly during Saturday morning, many of the showers ease, replaced by sunny spells and it turns a little milder. Later Saturday, cloud and rain will move in from the west along with the strengthening wind, coastal gales in the northwest. And that rain will topple across much of the country during Sunday. So a wet day is expected for many places, Wales northwards, especially over western hills. Further south, largely dry on Sunday with some bright spells in the southeast and again feeling milder. Now, during Monday and Tuesday, the heavy rainfall becomes very persistent across western parts of Scotland in particular. And over the hills, that rain will really build up 100, perhaps 200 millimetres in places with the risk of flooding. Further south, it's drier across Northern Ireland and much of Northern England, albeit with a lot of cloud and a strong wind. But further south again, and there'll be plenty of sunshine for the rest of England and much of Wales. And with southwesterly winds importing increasingly warm air, well, temperatures will rise. By Tuesday, parts of the southeast and eastern England could reach 24 degrees. Thank you, Aidan. Last week saw the launch of a unique event, bringing together scientists and a range of individuals from the creative industries. The virtual climate hackathon was made up of a series of brainstorming sessions looking at fresh solutions to climate impacts. Event organiser is Dr Mark Harrison, Head of Applied Science here at the Met Office. Essentially, it is a time-bound event where we bring people from different backgrounds together to focus on a particular challenge. What was tricky this time was it was the first time we'd actually done it virtually. So it's been done before, this time over two days, and you had certain themes. Yes, that's correct. Um, so we chose three themes. So one was nature-based solutions, another was marine and coastal, and the third was sustainable development. And we worked on forming challenges with our delivery partners, who are a range of organisations who are experts in those areas. So uh, who attended these events? In terms of participants, we had something like 300 people register, and they were data scientists, scientists, um, software engineers, and they came from a range of different organisations, research establishments, um, academia. So an amazing brain dump of information and creative ideas. Why are you doing a climate hackathon now? So the reason we held it was because we're trying to gain momentum as we run up to COP26, which is a conference that the UK is hosting in November in Glasgow. So we started by our hackathon this week, and then in the coming months, we're working with our Met Office academic partners, six different academic institutes, to run a series of hackathons that they're leading. It's really interesting. So like climate, the physics of climate, it knows no boundaries, and it's great to have collaboration with so many different sets of skills. Dr. Mark Harrison, thank you very much. Now, just before we go, here's Martin Bowles with last week's highs and lows. Here are the weather extremes for last week, observed between Monday the 15th of March and Sunday the 21st of March. The highest temperature of the week was 19.0 degrees Celsius at the Royal Botanical Gardens near Edinburgh on Thursday. The coldest place was also in Scotland. In the early hours of Sunday morning, minus 3.9 Celsius was recorded at Braemar in Aberdeenshire. In the week of the Equilux and the Equinox, when daylight hours became longer than nighttime hours, the largest recorded daily sunshine unobscured by cloud was 11.2 hours at Shoebury Ness in Essex. The greatest daily rainfall of the week was at Loch Glascarnock in Ross and Cromarty in the Scottish Highlands, where 14.6 millimetres was recorded on Tuesday. Thanks, Martin. That's it for Weather Snap. I'm Claire Nazir. Editor is Adrian Holloway. WeatherSnap is a podcast by the UK Met Office.